to the EDSFF April 2023 update panel uh, for the SNEA Compute and Memory Storage Summit. I'm John Michael Hands, and I'm the SNEA SSD Special Interest Group co-chair. And today we have assembled an expert panel for EDSFF. Myself, I'm John Michael Hands from Chia Network. Uh, I was developing a lot of the EDSF standards uh, when I was at Intel. I was the first product manager for the Intel ruler. So uh, I have a long history of EDSF and worked with uh, these gentlemen here on developing the specification. Uh, we have Jonathan Hinkle from Micron, who is a distinguished systems architect, Paul Kaler from HP, future storage architect, Kevin Mutt from Dell, server systems architect, and Lee Pruitt from Microsoft, who's the director of cloud hardware storage. So with that, our first presenter is going to be Jonathan Hinkle from Micron. So Jonathan, why don't you take it away? Hi, this is Jonathan Hinkle, and I'm a Distinguished Systems Architect at Micron in the Storage Business Unit. And today I'm going to talk about EDSFF explosion, what's happening with EDSFF and the trade-offs and the different ways that we're seeing EDSFF used today. So EDSFF, there's a significant promise as it was formed for the Enterprise and Data Center uh, standard for those form factors. And now that promise is proven. Uh, I think we've seen already from John Michael, uh, we have a family of cards, we have the same connector, pinout and behavior, uh, has better cooling, uh, power delivery, modularity and the density of drives can be improved and allows for higher capacity and performance for a variety of different needs. And it's also ready for new interfaces, future interfaces like Gen 6, PCIe and CXL uh, for high performance storage and new applications like main memory expansion. Um, you can see here with E1.S, E1.L, uh, you have this E1 that's uh, when you height optimize, and you have E3 family that's more to you height optimized, but they can be used in a variety of different systems to provide these same kind of benefits. So now what else can we do with these EDSFF slots? So we uh, can, can scale out uh, the count of uh, drives, the density uh, with smaller EDSFF form factors like the E1.S and the E3S1T. Um, you can see some more extreme examples here. I don't think this is exactly how we make most systems. Uh, usually it's some balance of other types of parameters, but you can definitely get a significant number of devices in a small space and the better cooling uh, overall helps you for EDSFF. Um, also, you can scale up to higher capacity and power with larger form factors like the E1.L uh, for capacity and the E3S2T. Um, especially for the E3S2T, you get this really higher power envelope that you can support for even more capable devices. And E1 to L, you have these larger capacity points that you can hit uh, while scaling out in a, in a one use form factor. So what are some of the trade-offs, the key trade-offs in the different system designs? Well, again, cost is king. So I think you'll see as our further uh, distinguished presenters show uh, some of their real systems they're shipping today. Um, there's a variety of different trade-offs, but number one of them uh, is king is uh, the cost. Uh, performance per drive uh, really does drive the, the value uh, per dollar, and especially at a high volume, uh, given capacity, then you get that much more utility out of the device, um, as well as the backplane cables and connectors. You have to uh, consider those and how much cost you want to size those appropriately uh, for how much performance and how much capacity you want. And um, the faster signaling as we go up in PCI Gen 5, Gen 6, and so on, there's, there's higher um, SI, uh, signal integrity requirements. So those uh, require other materials sometimes, but um, the SI is much better with the EDSFF. So we'll have more headroom with this connector and this, uh, these form factors going forward. Um, the storage uh, performance also scales out and it scales up with EDSFF. So um, the smaller form factors, you can allow for higher drive density again, uh, which allows you for performance um, times the number of drives. So you can put more drives, you get more performance, the saturated link of a by four, um, and you just get that much more bandwidth or IOPS. Also larger form factors, you get this highest performance per drive and you don't hit the power limits as, as easily. So you really have a choice and trade-off between those two um, while maintaining a certain amount of space. Uh, space is still a precious commodity in a system, the front system space, especially for hot swap devices. So making the most of it, you know, how many devices you need, how many cables do you want to connect to a certain number of devices? Um, and then, you know, what's your overall performance and thermal budget? Again, what I just said is thermal performance. Uh, a cooling is very, um, very important aspect of all system designs. Uh, ADSF improves that with our smaller and uh, new connector options like the right angle orthogonal connector. Uh, have to be really careful though, how much heat we pack in the front of a system, especially in front of a processor. Uh, 25 watts times 24 drives, 600 watts or so in front of the CPU and memory is, is already difficult to cool, difficult to cool 
And uh, you know, if we go higher or more more devices or higher power per device, then we'd have to consider that how that happens in a system. So there's really a lot of interesting new uses for EDSF as well. Um, they're being adopted for all types of different applications in addition to storage. And um, you know, we have this great connector, we have these great form factors that are standard and it's very popular now. Um, so how can we leverage that into other different spaces? People have already started looking at that. And you know, the way, same way that you can scale up and scale out in the system is very similar for other types of devices. So a few examples here, AI accelerator, uh, you can leverage uh, for the scale up or scale out of devices, maybe with ASIC or FPGA for computation. I have an example here is uh, there's a company called Blaze. They're doing an AI accelerator and it's an E1.S card. Um, and they're leveraging that for that density and, and small form factor for uh, inference, could be inference at the edge and so on. Uh, you also have um, the higher uh, power envelope and you can fit larger um, devices that, that do AI acceleration, uh, especially well suited for FPGA. Um, and then there's also CXL memory expansion, uh, which is a complement to DIMMs in a system um, where maybe you can actually expand capacity, expand bandwidth without having to have those coupled um, DIMM sockets right next to the processor. It's the only method for expanding memory. So I'm also excited to tell you about now uh, a new development. CXL memory modules now have been standardized uh, in the EDS FEF form factors and it allows for a first set of targets that systems can be designed uh, to support and enable. Uh, in JETIC, uh, we published the first CXL memory module spec, uh, JESD317, and specified uh, basically the ins and outs, sort of in the black box approach, uh, leveraging EDSFF. And the first targets being E1S by eight, E3S 2T by eight, and E3S 1T, uh, currently by four, maybe in the future by eight, you can see uh, the JESD317 spec, it's available now for download, and here's the link down below. So overall, CXL memory modules, they now enable for memory to be expanded, uh, physically removed from the processor, from the host system, even outside of the system, and allows for further capacity and bandwidth for memory. Um, the interesting thing here for us is especially they leverage that same EDSF slot um, for CXL, as what we use for PCIe attached NVMe drives, they can be enabled in the same slots and allow for a variety of different configurations and systems uh, to allow for those benefits uh, for different applications and workloads, including high performance computing, in memory database like SAP HANA, business analytics, and virtualized platforms. Another thing I wanted to tell you about is uh, really sort of an exciting expansion to the ecosystem. EDSFF has grown so much with E1 and E3 devices, um, further leverage being explored in the industry and especially in SNIA SFF, one new work has started, uh, SFF TA 1034. It's a new pluggable multi-purpose module that can be leveraged for a variety of different applications. Uh, it has EDSFF com uh, compatible connector and it supports up to 32 lanes of PCIe and or CXL. Uh, has high power support uh, of 400 watts plus, and it targets a height that fits within, the maximum will fit within a 1U rack space. So it's a very versatile modular form factor. And again, it can be leveraged for a variety of different subsystems or different kinds of applications and systems. Uh, so this would be a very interesting space to see as e EDSFF continues to expand in the industry. Thank you. My name is Paul Kaler. I'm a future storage architect with HPE, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about uh, some of our EDSFF uh, server options, uh, adopting E3.S um, after a long journey with uh, standardization and products coming out. So let's jump right in. <clears throat> some of us uh, have been working on this for a very long time now. It's been six or seven years. So it's really great to see some of the first uh, servers going to be coming out available for our HPE customers to take advantage of this uh, standard that's been long in the works. So if we look at some of our one use servers here, you'll see the uh, HP ProLiant DL320. <clears throat> These are all Gen 11 servers that are adopting EDSFF. The DL320 is a one U one processor system, and you can see it's got support for eight EDSFF E3.S drives. One thing you'll see throughout this presentation is all of our uh, servers are basically designed to support the swappability of E3.S so that so you can have one E3.S um, 
And you can uh, add a second one in, and that's the same volumetric space as an E3.S2T. So you can pull two of those E3.S's out and put in one E3.S2T in its place. So uh, almost all of our servers have that capability, and you'll see here uh, where that's spelled out. So you can support eight in the DL320 or four of the 2T variants in the DL320. Some of the workloads that the DL320 uh, supported under the purple line there, software-defined compute. I'm not going to read all the different uh, workloads. You'll have them here to kind of take a look at later. But you can see some of the differences between like the 1P systems and the 2P systems, <clears throat> whether you have more compute-focused uh, harder compute requirements that uh, you go to the 2P systems. So if you look over at the right-hand side, you see our ProLiant DL360 Gen 11. That's a 1U server again, but this is a two-processor uh, system, and this supports up to 20 EDSFF E3S drives or 10 of the E3.S 2T variants. And again, these are all PCIe Gen 5 capable systems. So this, again, is much more focused on compute-dense uh, solutions. Uh, very high performance workloads, very flexible 1U server. So now we look at our 1U uh, servers. These are actually very similar. These are the AMD based uh, systems. So these are, again, uh, if you look at the left, it's got a DL325. This is a 1U 1P system. It supports up to 20 uh, EDSFF E3.S drives or 10 of the E3.S 2T drives. Uh, it's got very similar workload uh, capabilities as 1U1P, um, so you can look, take a look at those uh, later. And then if you look at the right-hand side, that is our DL365 uh, AMD-powered unit, which is a 1U two-processor system, supports up to 20 EDSFF drives with the E3.S or 10 of the E3.S 2T. Then again, this is as a 2P processor system. This is for much more compute-dense solutions. Um, and some examples here like VDI, EDA, and CAD. So that's uh, some of our 1U systems. So now if we move on to our 2U systems, you can see here we've got our DL380, which is our big uh, workhorse server. That's a 2U, 2P server. It actually supports up to 36 EDSFF drives along the front. You can kind of see here there are three different drive cages uh, in the picture. We actually need to get some updated pictures here to show the EDSFF support of our newly launched servers. But you can see how each one of these main drive cages can actually be replaced with 12 EDSFF drives uh, or eight small form factor drives. And so you can mix and match between uh, what your requirements are for small form factor versus EDSFF. And this, all, again, has the capability to support either 36 or 18 of the E3.S 2T drives, uh, depending on how you want to mix and match. Uh, this, of course, is a very versatile server. It supports many, many different workloads. <clears throat> so you can see below just some of the small examples of the workloads that it supports. Then we go over to the right, you'll see our Reliant DL380A, which uh, is a 2U2P server as well, but this is very focused on AI workloads. Uh, so it actually supports four double wide or eight single wide GPUs up in the front. You can kind of see over to the right and left of the drive cage in the middle. Uh, it'll support uh, eight small form factor drives, or you can replace that drive cage and support eight EDSFF E3 drives or four of the 2T uh, E3.S variants. So this is, again, is very, very focused on AI workloads, uh, doing AI training and inference with all the, the GPU support here, and a mix of storage requirements that you have with the EDSFF um, capabilities now. And much like our 1U servers, you see our 2U servers uh, that are AMD based, AMD powered. Here you've got our DL345 on the left. This is a 2U one processor system. <clears throat> so again, very similar to our 1Us where you have more of a storage uh, intensive workload versus CPU. So you just have a 1P system that, and this supports up to 36 of the E3.S drives or again, 18 of the 2T variants. Um, like I said before, very data intensive workloads for this uh, type of system versus CPU. You look over to the right-hand side, and that's our DL385, which, again, powered by AMD. 2U, 2P system. This is uh, supports the same 36 EDSFF E3.S drives. Uh, and this is uh, for a little bit more when you need additional compute horsepower. Uh, you go over to the, to the 2P systems. So now to talk a little bit about our storage servers, so our HP Electra 4000 series family. Uh, you know, they've been adopting EDSFF as well. So you've got on the left-hand side our Electra 4110. This is a 1U2P. It's an all NVMe data storage server. It also supports 20 of our EDSFF E3 drives. Again, all Gen 5. 
You can see some of the uh, demanding workloads uh, listed below for data stores, distributed NoSQL databases, some of the high performance SDS systems. Um, and then if you look over to the right, you've got now our kind of hybrid mixed storage server. So this is our Electra 4120. It's a 2U, uh, 2P system, and it supports uh, both hard drives and SSDs. So it's hybrid uh, data storage server. And you can see here in the back, we actually support 12 EDSFF E3S drives. Uh, they're rear mounted <clears throat> clearly here showing that so that you can have your mix between your hard drives and your NVMe SSDs. This can cover a really broad range of your data storage centric workloads. So, you know, for data lakes where you need to have huge amounts of capacity, uh, you might put that on your hard drives and you do a lot of caching off on your NVMe storage on the back end here. So that uh, kind of gives you a quick overview of some of the servers that we've been launching here that are finally taking advantage of EDSFF. Over many, many years of standardization and productization, uh, we're now able to deliver this to our customers. So it's really exciting for those of us that have been working on this for five, six plus years uh, to kind of see this finally come to fruition. And uh, there's more servers. You can go to our website to check out which servers support EDSFF. This just gives you a quick overview of some of the servers we've been launching that now support EDSFF. And that's it. Thank you very much. I'm Kevin Munt, a senior distinguished engineer at Dell Technologies. I'm a member of our chief technology and innovation office for the infrastructure solutions group. At Dell, we were there when the EDSF group was created. We had a lot of interest in driving towards a new form factor that would meet enterprise storage needs. Many of the emerging form factors targeted client devices. These did not meet our reliability and performance needs of enterprise servers and storage devices. EDSFF was intended to address the needs of enterprise solutions. Of particular interest to Dell was the E3 form factor and its multiple variants. As we were developing the next generation of servers and storage solutions, everyone in the industry was working to address several pain points. Our CPU power consumption continues to climb. GPUs are being added to servers, and not only one GPU, but several GPUs. The ability to cool all these high-powered systems is challenging. More airflow is needed to cool these power-hungry components. Storage needs of servers also continues to climb. As we filled out the front of the server with storage devices, we were obviously impeding the airflow needed to cool the hot CPUs and GPUs at the back of the system. As an industry, we had conflicting requirements. We needed both more storage and more ventilation. The E3 thin, thin form factor is optimized for silicon storage. The reduced size of this device helps us on two vectors. First, the E3 thinner devices are half the volume of a two and a half inch drive while maintaining similar capacities. Secondly, for those systems with lower wattage components behind the storage, we can fill the front of the server with E3 devices. In a one use server, we go from 10 drives at the front to 20. As we put on our system integrator hat, the family of E3 form factors enables simplification of the overall chassis portfolio. There are several variants of the E3 devices. These are intended for mainstream storage, high capacity storage, and emerging categories like memory centric CXL devices and accelerators. The family of E3 devices enables easily configurable systems to support all of these needs. The end result of chassis simplification, the customer gains more flexibility at a lower cost. The E3 form factor was also designed to meet future needs. The two and a half inch hard drive and its connector were designed ages ago. Its wattage was capped at 25 watts and its bus speeds at the time were uh, much slower. E3 was designed to meet PCIe Gen 5 and Gen 6 needs and bus widths up to 16 lanes. And the largest devices can also support 75, 70 watts, much higher than what the uh, existing 2.5 inch drives could do. Well, the two and a half inch drive or the U.2 form factor is still perfectly viable and still valuable. 
the EDSFF E3 form factor is addressing many of our pain points. This enables us to increase system storage capacity or increase airflow to address thermal needs. Dell is currently rolling out the 16th generation of PowerEdge servers. This is our first generation adopting EDSFF E3 across the portfolio. We continue to support the two and a half inch form factor, but are introducing the E3 form factor across the portfolio. Since the 16G portfolio is still rolling out, I can only talk to solutions that have already been announced. But this small view already demonstrates a significant investment towards the future of E3. For 1U servers, we have multiple versions for both Intel and AMD servers. As you look to the images at the right, you can see that the smaller E3 devices have enabled significantly more airflow to the components behind the drives. For the 2U servers, we had 16 to 24 U.2 drives. We now have solutions that have increased airflow while maintaining that device count and solutions that increase NVMe device count up to 32 devices. This uh, enables significantly more capacity. As we look to the rest of the slide, you'll see that we're not just dipping our toe into the E3 waters. We're introducing E3 throughout the portfolio. We have E3 and four socket servers, acceleration centric servers, and our multi-node servers. As the CPU wattages for HPC needs increase, these platforms needed more airflow and E3 is helping us get to that added airflow. We're also introducing E3 devices to our modular sleds. This increased device count uh, helps us increase capacity and the RAID striping needs of these uh, smaller sleds. As I mentioned earlier, this is just a snippet of our 16G portfolio. Dell sees real value in the EDSFF E3 ecosystem. Our new power edge and storage portfolios are embracing the new form factor. And as the new memory centric uh, and accelerator CXL devices emerge, we look to E3 as an opportunity to simplify our deployments. Dell values the E3 ecosystem. Um, you know, I'm obviously uh, been working a long time with both Jonathan and Paul um, on EDSFF. Um, as Paul saying, it's been about seven years. Um, so Microsoft was one of the, the founding members of EDSFF. Um, and we are quite bullish uh, on these form factors, especially in the E1 variants. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, how we're doing with EDSFF at hyperscale. So uh, probably as an introduction, my name is Lee Pruitt, I'm Director of Hardware Cloud Storage uh, at Microsoft in the Azure. So without further ado, talk a little bit about our E1S use cases. Um, in this case, density matters. Um, it kind of looks funny if you look at the actual box itself, um, but it's not necessarily just the storage density here. Um, this concept design really only has four E1S drives in the 15 millimeter variant, but in overall, the one U with the two processors, um, FBA, G FPGA cards, uh, OCP NICs, um, you're starting to pack a lot of stuff into a small box. And so the EDSFF E1S really fits the bill to be able to allow for our compute clusters to have local storage for our vendor, you know, our customer VMs. So we have several different uh, swim lanes for these, uh, data, of course, cache drives, and boot. Now, uh, boot, in many cases, may uh, linger on in M.2, but uh, overall, moving to um, E1S and across these different uh, swim lanes is really super helpful in um, more robust, better thermals, uh, higher performance. Um, now, of course, there are multiple standard size, the different widths of these things, um, because there can never be just one. Um, but uh, what we see right now uh, with E1S, the majority is either 15 millimeter or 25 millimeter. And we are really bullish on the 15 millimeter because, again, it's kind of that trade off between uh, performance and the uh, how much space it takes on front of the box. So this is really where, you know, trading off between the IOPS for a given VM and the amount of storage that we can give that VM 
um, and how densely we can pack VM customers on a given one use system. So this is how that front panel efficiency really plays in to how these uh, E1S drives were designed and now are deployed um, in Azure in very large numbers. So on the other side of the house, we have Azure Storage. Azure Storage is very, very uh, bullish on the E1L. This is a uh, bulk storage for our high density bulk storage for HDD displacement. So it allows for uh, very dense systems that have uh, lots of storage on them that are you know, warm to hot data. So here, you know, you can see obviously HDDs have been around for many years. Um, you can see how uh, uh, they are, uh, they have some pros <laughs> as they are cheap, but pretty much everything else is a con. All the mechanicals there, um, the uh, slowness of the IOPS, um, you know, things around as we get into multi terabyte drives, 20 terabytes, 26 terabytes, um, we are seeing issues with the ability to actually service the IOs because you end up hitting an IOPS per terabyte wall um, somewhere in that range. So as we try and use that storage, we need to move to something like E1L, which allows for a much uh, denser IOPS per terabyte so that we can serve those warm workloads. And as we need to, we can make the HDD tier colder and colder as we go. So unfortunately, because of the cost of the SSD, we can't replace HDDs yet, but um, this is kind of how we start to look at the tiers and how we balance one versus the other. And with that, I was kind of short and sweet. <laughs> All right, I'm going to cover the EDSFF drive vendors and adoption. If you recall, we, we did a little webcast uh, after the OCP Global Summit on EDSFF ecosystem update. Uh, one of the things I did was kind of walk around with my phone while I was at the OCP Global Summit and filmed a bunch of the drive vendors and the system vendors for EDSFF platforms just to kind of showcase the, the, the breadth of the ecosystem. So that was a lot of fun. You can find that on the SNEA YouTube channel, but we got to cover some of the systems. Uh, but was was really exciting for me as someone who worked on the EDSFF specifications uh, was now you can get S, uh, EDSFF SSDs available from almost every single SSD vendor. So Kioxia has their E1.S and E3. Samsung has the same E1.S, E3. They have this PM9 E3 in the E1.S. And I think I believe it's the PM1743 for the E3. Solidime has the uh, D7 P5520 in the E1.S. And uh, and we have the Micron recently announced uh, E1.S 7450. We have the Smart Modular DC4800, SK Hynix, uh, and Fadu. So we have just Every other vendor, uh, I know WD uh, Western Digital also has an E1.L. And so most of these vendors are now not only just announced the products, but actually shipping them in high volume uh, to hyperscalers and then now in these uh, uh, OEM platforms that support EDSFF. So this is definitely an exciting inflection point for the ecosystem now that the you can get EDSFF from all these different drive vendors. Um, that the one really exciting thing that uh, I was really excited about in EDSFF is that with the higher power envelopes of E1.S, you can get U.2 performance in a smaller form factor. So you can get very similar to U.2 performance for similar capacities like a two and four terabyte type drive uh, in, in this smaller form factor. And that, that that's really interesting for different system types. Um, one of the most disappointing things I have seen in the SSD form factor world is that the desktop and workstation seg segment have not moved on from M.2. Now, I, I suspect that they will figure out the same thing that the hyperscalers did, which is M.2 has severe limitations at PCIe Gen 5 and beyond because of just the power envelope you need to get to the higher performance. And it, it shouldn't be that surprising when you have a you know, desktop that, that has a four 500 watt GPU and 300 watt CPU, you know, that to use a you know, 20 watt, 15 watt uh, SSD versus an 8 watt M.2, that shouldn't be a big deal. Um, and, and then these have the heat sinks already built into them so they can get the cooling and they'll be much better for these these higher end systems. So I, I you know, unfortunately, we haven't seen any, um, I haven't seen a ton of workstations and desktops that, that support these, but uh, I, I am hopeful that we, we will see that in the future. 
So I, I spoke with uh, the IDC industry analysts and uh, Jeff Janukowicz, who's their, their analyst, does this EDSF uh, adoption as part of their SSD reporting. And the, you know, instead of, um, I think at the last webcast, we showed off some future predictions out into 2026 and beyond. Um, but today we just want to kind of show the adoption today, which is uh, in 2021, it was about five exabytes of EDSFF across the entire SSD um, CAM. And now in 2022, we, that jumped to almost uh, 14 exabytes. And so this is largely hyperscale, uh, but as we move into um, you can see here that that represents, uh, you know, a kind of tiny chunk of the overall uh, SSD form factors for PCI Express, which is, or, you know, mostly two and a half inch and uh, M.2 today. But this whole M.2 chunk is going to be shifting over to E1.S as they move in the hyperscale over from M.2 to E1.S. And then uh, the E3 is going to come from mostly from this two and a half inch in OEM servers and the majority of other platforms. You heard from Dell and HPE on OEM systems that support the E3 form factors. I wanted to showcase another vendor, Supermicro, who not only supports E3, but also the E1 form factors. They were one of the earliest partners on the Intel ruler, which eventually got morphed in and donated into EDSFF as E1.L. And now they have systems that support the, the storage systems for E1.L. But what I'm most excited about is the stuff that they recently announced for the Intel Sapphire Rapids and AMD Genoa platforms. So these are all uh, EDSFF platforms that support PCIe Gen 5. And they have an E3 platform, uh, this ASG1115S uh, NE316R uh, that supports this 16E3.S1T uh, in a 1U form factor. And this is all, is also supports E3.S2T. So you can basically put a 2T drive into two of these slots and it will take up two of the slots. Uh, the other system, uh, the E1.S is showing this, you're gonna get the maximum bandwidth and performance in a 1U with 24 E1.S in a, in a 1U, 9.5 or 50 millimeter. This is going to be a huge amount of storage bandwidth at PCIe Gen 5. So the, the two U platforms, you can see they have this one that supports uh, E3.S 1T for kind of a mainstream platform. And then they have this 1U that will op optionally support the E3.S 2T by eight slots for CXL so that you need higher bandwidth. So they have a full breadth of systems uh, and then this uh, E1.S one is available now and I believe the other ones will be shipping here in June or July uh, very shortly. So this is uh, again, very exciting uh, to see all these new platforms from Supermicro. The EDSFF specification updates. Jonathan gave an update on the CXL memory module and the, the JetX specifications, as well as the pluggable module, that it's gonna be a multi-purpose module. I really think that's exciting because then now people can make interoperable server components uh, that can use PCI Express to, to link different things together. Uh, there's a lot, ton of different use cases for that. I'm also excited about E3 for other use cases. Um, the ones that have been updated in the 2.03 spec are kind of designed for this support for 4C+, so the current OCP NIC spec, and then the, the 2X 1C connectors. So you could have a CXL module that is meant for an SSD backplane uh, that has by four connections on the back. So you could have a SSD backplane uh, that supports either uh, EDSFF E3 uh, 1T SSDs or an E3 uh, 2T uh, CXL module. There are uh, obviously those, those use cases are defined in these specs and then the label positioning and then there's some stuff about the LED definition, new power activity and fault identify. Uh, I've been detailed in this 2.03 spec. And we talked a little bit about uh, SFFTA1023, uh, the thermal characterization. Uh, that's still up, out there for people that want to do thermal testing and uh, for EDSF drives. And then there are some minor changes to the SFFTA1009, the pinout specification uh, to support IC3. And so uh, Anthony Constantine uh, from Intel uh, spoke a little bit about this at the uh, OCP Global Summit uh, EDSF update. As you can see, we're super excited about the EDSF ecosystem. We've had tremendous progress now with, again, all SSD vendors shipping uh, EDSFF products. And we have basically all the system manufacturers. We have OEMs, we have hyperscalers. We have real world adoption as, you know, ramping up 3X uh, year over year growth in EDSFF. And we're just so excited that these products are finally hitting the market. We are expanding EDSFF use cases to CXL, NIC modules. There's going to be the GPUs. There's going to be 
uh, add-ins for servers and cabling. Uh, so the options are endless and EVSFEV is just going to be a core part of server architecture going forward. Uh, so with that, thank you and please rate the uh, session and provide any questions you guys have in the comments. Thanks. Thank you.